I want to thank you all for the privilege of uh, excuse me, for the privilege of speaking here, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share uh, some of my knowledge and uh, how I got here. And briefly, I kind of wanted to go through some of my past to kind of show where I ended up, where I did. And this is me as a kid, always uh, around the turtles, about 10 years old. I had a creek that went through my backyard. I found all kinds of turtles. Some of my first memories were, you know, dragging big snappers out of the creek. Um, teaches at uh, Washburn down here in St. Louis and he still does a lot with turtles and a lot of blood DNA work with box turtles. He's uh, quite an accomplished academic with uh, reptiles. There's me with a common snapper and like I said it's just always always been in my blood but this book in 1967 was you know, so instrumental for me. It taught me, you know, the, the different described species, although so much has changed since then. Uh, so many of, of much of the, the genuses and subspecies have shifted around, but, you know, that, you know, really got me started to where I really, you know, got my scientific names down. And, uh, but this book right here was, you know, what I refer to as the Rosetta Stone for me. Dr. Pritchard, there was so much that he didn't know in when he wrote this book, and he laid that out. And since this book has been written, so much research has been done that a lot of those blanks have filled in. And I, I just can't even begin to tell you how important his work has been, not just you know, not just with me, but with, you know, people that, that, you know, this is the book for really understanding the species and its range and uh, so much of its natural history. It, it, as old as it is, it's, it's just got such pertinent information in it. And here's the man right here himself. This is an interesting environment here <coughs> back in about 94. This is about 95 or 6. Dr. Pritchard wanted to get some headlight footage of the alligator snapping turtle. Well, this place right here is a place in Arkansas that is still there. And this used to be kind of a hub for when turtles were being butchered in Arkansas. And they were bringing them from all over the place, all over you know, the South were being brought to this place and, and what, but Dr. Pritchard wanted this um, egg laying footage of these turtles. Very difficult for a British man with two Japanese film guys to cozy into the South without, with, you know, he just wasn't trusted. You know, they thought that he was there to federally list the animal, that he was gonna put them out of business. Well, I got a phone call I was in Springfield, Missouri, and I was a salaried chef at the time. And, and, but I had spoken to Dr. Pritchard, and Dr. Pritchard knew that I knew these guys down there that were doing this, this butchering, and he really wanted this, this egg laying sequences. And uh, it really took some diplomatic you know, maneuvers to get them to trust him, to let them know that he wasn't there to he was there to gather information, but to do this filming. And it was so surreal when they were all done with it to see Dr. Pritchard and his two Japanese film guys eating biscuits and gravy on the Cache River 
uh, you know, it was just so bizarre. But um, he got what he needed, and this was before I, you know, got into Louisiana and was, was buying turtles that were going to be, which is, this is fairly early on. Um, this um, was my breeding facility. This is my breeding facility here from the very early years. It's very, very stark. Um, this is where, you know, these turtles were being butchered. We started breeding bringing them back and putting them, you know, in this facility here. And it's 25 years later, this is a completely different looking operation. This is what I was talking about in Arkansas where they were butchering the turtles. This was 1993 and they would bring the alligator snappings. They were bringing them from Alabama. They were bringing them from uh, all over Arkansas, even Western Kentucky. I think they were still taking them out of Kentucky at the time. And it was just so grim. I couldn't, you know, it was so unfathomable that they were doing this, but it was legal. And um, we were lucky enough, we petitioned hard in Arkansas to the Game and Fish and mercifully, they shut it down in October of 93. Uh, they acted fairly quickly, um, I, I must say. They, uh, Louisiana was another story. Louisiana perpetuated it for a much longer time. But the damage in Arkansas was, was significant because you know when they go in and trap these animals, they will trap a whole section of bio or river and they, in essence, just take out the whole adult population. Very few uh, escape, you know, being drawn into a trap. So really all you have left is the very small ones that don't go in the trap. And, you know, it just stunts the population so badly. And, um, but they've been protected in Arkansas since 93 and from reports that I've heard um, from reliable sources, people that have no, no dog in the fight, that they have come back exceedingly well. And that's hard for me to fathom because of the factors working against it with the you know, raccoon predation on nests and fire ants and uh, uh, jug lines and trot lines and limb lines and yo-yos. I mean, there's just so much uh, you know, chipping away at adult populations in the South where laws are lax on how you fish and bag limits. And in Arkansas at the time, you could take any amount of turtles, alligator snapping turtles, no size limit. It was just wild, wild west. And they did a significant amount of damage, I mean, big time. Uh, but they did get it stopped. Um, this uh, brings me down into Louisiana. And I knew that after Arkansas had closed, there was one state left that was um, uh, still open to commercial harvest of the alligator snapping turtle. and. I knew it was going on on a pretty good scale. I knew that the, the, the markets where they were doing the butchering, but I didn't really have any idea specifically where their turtles were coming from. But it didn't take a lot to find this network of professional turtle trappers that were, um, basically they were selling them for a dollar a pound to places like Wiley's, which is in the center of Louisiana. And, you know, it's just the amount of turtles that they've butchered at places like um, Wiley's is, it's just unthinkable. Um, the amount of, of, of turtles that were, you know, that were butchered there of this species that just cannot stand commercial pressure. Um, and the commercial end is, is, is the important part. You know, this species didn't get, you know, scares from 
a family taking one home and eating it, you know, every couple of months. I don't like seeing that. I don't want any part of it. But that isn't what put this turtle in peril. It was no doubt about it. It was the commercial harvest. And this is one of the old boys that um, A.W. Townsend, the late A.W. Townsend, um, he knew all the trappers. And I met him in 1995 and um, and I started buying these turtles before they would send them to the market and I was a little flat-footed my pond wasn't set up great but nonetheless I started you know with kind of a leap of faith bringing these animals back to Missouri 500 miles north not really knowing if they were going to be able to withstand the winters if they were going to be able to withstand the pH changes and just whole geography difference of Louisiana and the Ozarks of southern Missouri. And it's just one of those things that they adapted very, very well. This is A.W.'s brother. We called him One-Eyed Gene. And <laughs> he was a piece of work, let me tell you. But, uh, you know, this was what they did in you know, like around Easter till about June, was they trapped loggerheads. And they went at it hard. And, you know, they were selling them for a dollar a pound. And my goal was to keep those guys from sending those turtles to market. I didn't know what, what I was going to do, how they were going to adjust for breed. But I was buying them as fast as they was catching them. This is a this is this isn't a crazy Cajun guy. This is a buddy of mine, Steve Angeli, who actually is a big breeder of beaded lizards. Um, Fordham Angeli is his, uh, but he went down there with me for the first time to Louisiana, and this is what we walk into. I mean, look, everything, anything that can hold water has got turtles in it, barrels, old freezers, refrigerator on its side over here. It's just, it's just nuts. I mean, they. <coughs> I, I just couldn't believe what I was walking into down there. And um, needless to say, we came home with, you know, a lot of these animals. And, you know, the term rescue is a little thrown around these days. And I don't even really know what to think of the term. But I think that this really is a rescue. These animals were going to end up in a soup pot. And, you know, I... I'm just thankful that that we've done good with them. We've got a lot of them into educational exhibits and zoos. And I certainly hope that the positive impact that we have with our breeding group has got a bright future because there's, there's so much <coughs> Good week. This is me probably 25 years ago. But, and you can see how stark this this breeding facility is. I mean, no trees on the bank. It's not the best environment. Nonetheless, these animals did pretty good. This is an interesting little side. This is, these are from Al Redmond. These are the Sawaniensis subspecies. And you can see that they have a they have a little different look to them. I mean, almost a wood grain. Uh, real prominent keels. Whoops. Um, forgive me with the blatant clicker here. Um, but uh, at any rate, that's just a, an interesting note there, that this is the uh, Sawaniensis subspecies um, that came out of the Flint River system when Georgia was still open for commercial harvest. Um, and this is letting some of these uh, turtles go, coming back from Louisiana. And they, the, the uh, pond that they're in, it's deep. It's uh, anywhere from 16 to 20 feet deep. Um, you can see they come up out in the middle and they're real comfortable in groups together. Um, uh, 
it's amazing that you know you can just tell that these animals are are loose knit colony oriented and are very comfortable next to each other. Um, you, know, you see several of them up there, um, and they have dug up under these banks where you get these under <laughs> under the bank caverns and they hibernate up in there they lay up in there during the day and you know this is the type of environment that these turtles really are drawn to where they can you know can, can get cover and basically hang out during the day because they are a, a a cheaply nocturnal species and you know over over the years they've created a lot of their own environment that's favorable to them and, you know that's just one of those things I, I, I could never have really known that and now you can see that there's trees hanging this is within the last couple of years here you can see uh, various heads there but lots of cover and um, getting into it. Um, I want to talk a little bit. This is a this is a nest here and before we dig it. And I wanted to kind of explain this is where the front claws are up here. And they make these furrows from where they unearth the it's it's a very telltale nest. And it's, it's difficult to get perspective with just, um, you know, not, not in 3D, but um, there is a lot of earth move in this picture. I know it's difficult to tell, but you can see, I don't know if that's my feet or my son's feet, but it's a pretty good size swath there, a couple, couple feet. There's some feet in the picture. And here you can see the, um, the claws, see up here where they kind of anchor in, because some of this stuff is hard to dig in, and they anchor themselves like it's 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 almost like physics defying that they can dig the nest that they do um, and stay anchored down without you know coming off the ground and just not able to dig in, but. It's, it's pretty amazing feat, and I'm just continuously amazed by how these turtles carve these nests out in perfect dimension for the amount of eggs that they have in them, and it's just always perfect. This is another nest that you can see. You can see the uh, front claws up here, and this is where they've wet the ground completely, emptied their... Uh, uh, bladder and soften the ground and this is earth that's been brought back up to backfill the nest and then the nest would be the nest cavity would be right in here and they're good sized nest cavities because you're looking at uh, you know anywhere from usually 24 to 34 eggs there's a nesting female you know, you can see that she's really worked over the ground around the nest excavation site. And the tail often gets kind of buried in the, in the ground. I gotta give credit, my son has just gotten really good at some of these photographs. I, I can't believe he's pulling this off. Uh, I wasn't around when he did this, but it's just hard to imagine getting that close to these animals and and them still cooperating with you and, and, and laying. Um, I'd like to play a, a short video of them uh, laying.
but mm -hmm. we're on the way. Very difficult to get to get an animal that will, will do this while you've got a camera that close to it. I, I still don't know how he managed this, but this is the best we've seen of them dropping eggs in a nest and um, and then covering the nest back up. Usually, he just won't won't continue or cooperate if somebody's close. But on this day, this turtle cooperated and uh, it got us some of the best footage we've ever had. And, uh, I'm just really thankful we were able to uh, capture it. Most of them, about 80% of them lay before the sun comes up. You catch some out, you know, maybe 20% still up laying or come out of the water to lay after sunrise. You, you look at these nests after they've completed them, and, and until you see this, you don't really understand how you get that, those forensics of these piles and these claw marks and everything that goes into basically digging a, a, a you know, a, a quart and a half size glass shaped nest that they deposit their eggs in, and get a cap on it and uh, it's, it's truly amazing and the, the depthness with which they will place these eggs into uh, place and sometimes they're placing the way that the angle that they dig the nest they're placing the eggs up almost in the top of the nest cavity with the backs of their claws, and they never break an egg. You just, it's hard to fathom how these, you know, these brutes have such, you know, fine motor skills with her rear feet. But they do. She's in her tail to keep center. And yeah, and, and that's one of the biggest forensic things you eat for, for, for spotting a nest and knowing what's what where is you can usually see where the tail has pushed into the ground. And you get a pretty good idea of the ova position and subsequently where the, the nest cavity is. Once again, my son did this with an iPhone. <laughs> you can tell this animal is just not designed for the land. And, you know, these females don't go over about 50 pounds. They're the smaller of the gender. Um, this is excellent footage here. It just, it's so cool watching these animals go back into their element and just sink into the...
is a typical clutch uh, ping pong ball size, and uh, they uh, a lot of times, like I said, they're they're stuck up in the top of the nest and almost just like packed like Vienna sausages in a can. It's just amazing how tight they can get them in these nests because these eggs still have to expand as they develop. They will lose that uh, hardness so much and will become more leathery and pressure filled as the baby turtle start as the embryo starts starts forming. And um, you can see in that nest there that it's one that that isn't so much a top to bottom, it's almost like drilled into the side of these animals almost always will lay on an incline. Um, it's got to have something to do with not wanting their nest flooded by being in a low area and they instinctively head side head uphill want to lay on an incline and they, they all do that. Um, you just don't see them much laying on, on flat ground. We use uh, um, perlite and vermiculite to uh, incubate the uh, eggs in. Um, this is my hatchery. I keep it uh, thermostatically controlled. Uh, it's not as natural as I wish. I I kind of hate the whole idea of putting them on wire racks and plastic boxes. I really wish there was some way we could, you know, leave them in the ground and keep them from varmints and getting predated. I think, you know, these natural nests have an incredibly high uh, uh, hatch rate, and I don't care what you do, it's so difficult to imitate mother nature with something artificial like this. I mean, if I'm getting to 91, 92%, you know, I feel like I'm really doing good because there's just no replacement for those eggs in the earth. It's just, you know, but this is, this is how we do it. Uh, thermostatically controlled hatchery. Um, these eggs at 80 degrees will produce a mix of gender at about 95 days incubation time. And that's relatively accelerated for wild nests or generally uh, in the neighborhood of 110 to 15 days incubation time. And of course, that's a fluctuating temperature um, that goes up and down but you just can't beat mother nature. These are uh, fully chalked over eggs. You can see that they're alive and you know, snow white. Uh, the discolored eggs, whether they're non-fertile or whether they just were a failure to launch thing, they won't keep that snow white color. They will discolor, they will kind of get crystalline and uh, they're just, uh, they're not good. There's no saving them. There's an egg beginning to pip here and there. And, you know, it's so odd watching these guys when one starts to pip, it's like they're interfaced because they're all going in about 12 hours. And it's, it's like time to go. <laughs> and uh, they all start hatching in, a rel in relatively short order. And that's a very close up there. There's the egg tooth that they use to slit the leathery um, egg. And after they hatch out of the eggs, the eggs just disintegrate and almost turn to paper. Uh, just completely uh, 
the gray. They're done. And that's a little box of hatchlings there. Everybody's out. That guy's fired up right off the bat there. That's one of those unusual shots. You don't get something like that very often. With his tail sticking right up next to his head, he's flying his little flag. But I'm fascinated with this every year. I mean, the digging of the eggs, the, their hatching. I, I, I never, I, I'm always thrilled with just the wonderment of it. And I've been at it a while. But you can see they're pretty fired up sometimes right from, right from the hatch. And they know right what to do right off the bat. They start luring before they even realize they're hungry. If you have, you know, gambusia, which is their really their primary food source when they're hatchlings, and the, throughout the range of the alligator snapping turtle, you're going to find gambusia um, or the mosquito fish, which feed on mosquito larvae, and they that little lure in the bottom of their mouth looks so close to what mosquito larva, the way it wiggles and, and, and jerks, that you know you can see that this is something that's been working for a long, long time. And you see they get pretty stealth in a natural situation to where, where you can't, they just blend right in. If something you didn't really have a trained eye or know what you were looking for, you walk right past them. I have a greenhouse that I set up several environments in. I don't have this particular environment anymore, but they like the water hyacinth. They, they hang out up in the roots, sometimes kind of vertical, uh, to where they can just lure just below the surface of the water in, in a vertical position and catch some of those gambusia, and you would never know that there might be three or four little turtles up in that hyacinth. Uh, roots, uh, you, you would never know. Um, we use a lot of mason sand for the hatchlings, and you can see here that they just sink right into it. And uh, this turtle just wants to blend in and and be stealth, but but lure. And you can see what they're too luring there. I think that one's got his mouth open. That one does too. There's a load, several of them luring there inside of a log. And you know those turtles are about an inch and three quarter shell length, so kind of size perspective there. They seem to be able to at night. Um, the papillae, which are the stud-like projections around the head and neck, as well as being oxygen receptors, uh, they're also, they, they, they call it papillae, is the, 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 the scientific term. But they're, al they're also receptors for slight currents in the water from moving fish and fish fins, moving little bits of water, and they know when their prey is around them. Uh, they instinctively open their mouths <laughs> and uh, sight alone. The, these turtles in, in the right environment wouldn't even need eyesight to, to feed and, and grow. They're, they're, they're so keen on detecting fish close and just knowing if they lay there with their mouth open long enough, they will get some business. And you know, people will have a tendency to think, oh, they can't catch the fish, I, my turtle can't catch the fish. You know, sweetheart, they've been doing this a long time. They're, <laughs> they're, they, they get what they need. I 
I shot a one buried in the mason sand. You know, in, in certain environments, you, you will find that they, the, the, the young uh, of, of the ones that end up in larger streams and rivers, particularly in the southeast, where there really isn't the bio and swamp environment, they're really more riverine, more mollusk eaters uh, than the Mississippi, uh, Mississippi Ensis strain, that they bury in a mix of mollusk shells and sand and silt and you know that's how these babies uh, these hatchlings escape detection that isn't even in the water that guy was just fired up and I just happened to catch him with my iPhone These are just some juvenile size that I have. But this is an in, some interesting color variations. I'm not so much into the, the that end of it, but I can't help but notice some of these uh, outliers that are lighter and um, and have uh, less pigment or more. Uh, and of course, people are just nuts about this stuff, and you know, I guess rightfully so. But. Uh, the video and then there's a good example there of the, the difference in some of the pigment of them. And they're just you know so specialized such you know beautiful animals they really in, in my opinion they got to be considered one of the top five most unique and bizarre species that we have on the planet. Nice colored one there. Another one. These are interesting. The the, the this these pigment challenged one, they don't have the gunmetal gray color natural floor of the mouth that really looks like the organic swamp uh, uh, but you know everything is is, is is kind of pinkish coral color just very unique and you get these just bizarre uh, patterns on the jaw lamina and uh, quite quite striking This is a guy that brought brought a turtle back to us after about ten years. It got too big for him, and you know, and it was you know probably thirteen inches or so, and you know, kind of unusual putting it back in the uh, breeding pond with its parents. Um, just uh, uh, just I, you know, I tried to keep people from letting him go and encourage that they, if they outgrow their tank or quarter, you know, please, let's not be letting them go in areas where they don't belong. That's, we know how that ends. <laughs> it ends up with, you know, species being banned because of irresponsible people. So we try to get people to, um, you know, give them the outlet to return them, trade them for smaller ones, uh, just keep them where they're, you know, you know, uh, especially with these captive bred animals, um, with that long, it, you just have to discourage people putting them back in the wild. This is just some shots around the, um, 
this is an interesting piece. This was a like a kyphotic one that was kind of a hunchback, and uh, you know it it lived. It's still, I'm sure, kicking. These are just shots that my sons got from around the farm. These turtles, for all practical purposes, believe they're in the wild. You can't approach them. They are so skittish by just by nature. And they just don't tame in that environment. They tolerate you to a degree. And uh, that's about really all you can, all you can say. This is my son with every now and then he'll pull one out of the pond if he sees it in a spot and uh, <coughs> grab some photos and put them back. And that is about the extent of our interaction uh, with them. We try to keep it infrequent and not stress these animals out. This is an interesting situation. It, these animals appear to be quite cold tolerant. <clears throat> and it always is confusing for people. They think, you know, this is a southern animal, you know, they, it doesn't ice over where they come from. And to be honest, I didn't know when I was, you know, bringing them back to Louisiana if they would tolerate a winter 500 miles north. But they do live at latitudes that I live at, but it would appear that animals from the southern end of the range can withstand the same temperature extremes as turtles from the northern end of the range, because my this pond has developed as much as 12 inches of ice on it in some outlier winters, and we just don't lose an animal. So they can't get up and get air all the time. And I'm talking about 12 inches of ice, sometimes for uh, four to six weeks. And they, as long as the pond is healthy and the oxygen stays dissolved in the, in the right amounts, I've, I've never had any issues. It makes, it makes me nervous, <laughs> but you know, it, it, some of these animals have been in there 25 years now, and in that block of time, there just isn't a lot. I mean, we've had some really, really harsh winters, and uh, you know, it's disconcerting. Sometimes these animals will come up and kind of congregate and huddle up where you know, there's clarity and you can you can see them so well, and. You know, you just think of it. Gosh, they, they, they need to grab a breath of air. But, you know, they don't. And they're so still alert, even under the ice, that you can see their eyes shift in the orbits. So they can detect you and see you through the ice and kind of slowly meander back out to the middle if they're spooked enough. But even though that water is probably 33, 34 degrees, they're able to navigate around without coming up to need air, which is kind of one of those things you just wouldn't, uh, wouldn't know. Here's another shot of them under the ice. That's probably a 80 pound male on the left. There's a little bit of relief from the ice there, but uh, that's winter time there little clearing. That's where one came up and pushed his snout through and got a breath of air, cracked it, and went back on his way. This was, this is before egg laying season. 
uh, but before they begin to lay eggs, it's starting to, and all, this is about just after the sun comes up, and boy, when they are primed to lay, they come up to the edge of the bank, and they stick so much more of their head up out of the water and are so, you know, trying to get in tune with coming out of the water, doing their deal, digging their nest and laying it, and you just don't typically see them stick their heads up quite that far. Usually it's, it's more the tip of the nose, but they get, um, they get really outward, um, late May especially, when they're uh, laying eggs. We occasionally have some flooding and high water, and my ponds are a series of ponds that drop from one to the next, and you know, water gets to flowing and flash flooding, and those, when, when there's flash flooding, and those turtles at times will come out of the water, the adults. It's not something you usually see. And, um, and they motor around, and this was some, uh, a picture we took when uh, everything was kind of flash flooding at the farm. This is where we had a flash flood, and it uncovered a nest <laughs> um, that we missed. And as much as that nest got completely, the top of it knocked off, <coughs> those eggs are fine. You can tell by how white they are. They're all good. And of course, we had to remove the eggs, but they all hatched. This is an interesting decision. And of all the times that I've had these animals in this pond. I've never seen an adult luring. And this is about a 60 pound animal. And he was up in the shallows. And uh, it, I just came across it and was lucky enough to have my phone with me. And uh, uh, just a, a, one of those rare shots you get of an animal of that size in a completely natural situation, uh, even though it's confined, but a, a, uh, in a soft bottom pond like that, and uh, catch them luring. Because there's a lot of uh, conjecture about them not really being a luring animal as they get some size on them, but they're more of a forager across the bottom, or they would just hold their mouth open and wait for a random blunder, not so much of something biting on the lure, but of something wandering through the mouth like uh, a crayfish or a, uh, a musk turtle or, you know, siren or some kind of uh, uh, amphibian. But that animal is luring, and I've got some video later, and he's got that tongue that's just dancing. And I think that's basically the same thing, the reflection on that is kind of crazy. So Laura, that was about a 160 pound animal, which for me is about the largest that I've really seen out of the wild. You know, people can put a lot of weight on them by feeding them too much, which I really discourage. The animal does best when it's lean. They're caught lean. They live a long, long time. And the way they live a long time is by staying lean. And, you know, fattening these things up is just no good. No good. This is uh, Neil Reddick. This is out of the uh, Dr. Pritchard's book, The Biology and Conservation of the Alligator Snapping Turtle. And this is down in Georgia at an old boy named Al Redman that was, he was like in the 81 or 82 National Geographic. And Al Redman did a lot of damage to the alligator snapping turtle in southeast United States. Well, Neil's a videographer, 
I came to find out later. I thought he was just some Georgia Yehu, you know, that was over at Owls and took the picture of this big turtle. But he's quite an accomplished videographer. This is Neil now. And he's an accomplished falconer. And he came out with Nat Geo Wild two years ago. And they wanted an egg laying sequence to get for the Nat Geo Wild. And they got a pretty good they got a pretty good nesting sequence. Not quite as good as the one that <laughs> my son got, but a pretty good one. And it turned out well enough that they came back in September to film them hatching and to just kind of make their segment on Nat Geo Wild um, more of a full cycle of, of laying the hatching. And it was just so cool working with him uh, and you know what he brings to the table with his experience and videography and just you know he, he has just a, a broad range of uh, you know natural history of, of a wide swath of uh, animals and we, we just really enjoyed uh, uh, our time and these are just random sh shots of the you know the breeder pond and they I just can't imagine it turning out any more better for these things. And it's nothing I did. It just evolved into a, a great environment that these animals would be so prolific and, 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 and females laying every year and, uh, and, and, and basically everything copacetic. It doesn't go all Lord of the Flies, where you got animals <laughs> picking on each other, and uh, you know, you know, you don't know how things are going to break. Um, but these are pretty colony-oriented animals that do well in in groups. Um, I would say when you do things like drain their water, if you would drain that pond, that it would be a ballistic mess of turtles biting each other. The same way if you would like put a trap in there to, um, like there was a time that they wanted me to pit tag all my animals, the conservation department. Was, and I reluctantly started, uh, but you can't just get one turtle in a net. You end up with five or six in there, and you end up with 300 pounds of animals in a trap and you can't even get it out of the water and they're trying to bite each other and it's 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 just a mess but in a natural situation like these this these animals are so uh, they're fine being um, in, in, you know in these in these groups like this and just kind of one of those things how would you know and over the years we've had you know timber fall in ice storms there's so much cover in, 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 in this pond. That, and, and, and this species really likes to find places to wedge in. And, um, you know, like uh, uh, Jeff was showing with the, the hellbenders, how they like to, you know, find these crevices to uh, get in and, and nest and stuff. These animals like that same thing, but where they can wedge in and, uh, uh, you know, nature has provided, you know, these these down trees, and and they've been able to cut up under the banks, and uh, basically create their own environment, favored environment, and and then nature provides the trees that fall in the water over the years, and it's you know quite a beautiful thing. It really is. Um, That's before, uh, and, and you can see that's just that's just the way they line up at, at, at dawn, um, and a lot of them have, have finished nesting by the time the sun comes up. But you know, if everything is is quiet and right, most of those animals will come up and lay. And if they're not laying today, they're probably laying tomorrow because they're ready. 
And the, the interesting thing is I've been able to kind of partner up with some of these bow fishermen over the years that go out and uh, now you're seeing these carp derby things where these old boys have bows with fishing reels on them and they shoot these rough fish and it's chiefly carp, but, um, but uh, they have no way to really responsibly dispose of them and you can't just you know shoot piles of these things and throw them back in the lake so it's just really kind of been a, a, an interesting you know partnership with these guys that um, a lot of these people are very e you know ecology minded if they're going to shoot something they like to see it be used for something some don't care, but a lot of them are kind of a, a new age of sportsmen that we have that, that, that do care. And it does mean something to them that, uh, that they don't just get buried in a hole in the ground, that you know some good is coming of it. So it, it's just really cool that I'm able to feed my animals fresh, organic food, and it's a natural thing for them, and and I don't even have to pay for it. I mean, they're, we're tripping over each other, thanking each other. It's uh, one of those weird things. Shot around the farm. One, I think that was a one that was sent back and we're putting it back in the breeder pond. And that guy, he's, <laughs> he's really come to appreciate and love these animals. He'll never understand the, the, the scientific names, and he's got a love for a broad range of animals, but he's really learned so much about these animals just by being around them for years. And uh, I really appreciate his appreciation because you can see in the photography and stuff that he does, he does this because he, he loves photographing this stuff. He's in wonderment of it, as as I still am. This is how they catch most of them, like in Louisiana. This is the standard hoop net. You know, the turtles will go in, this funneled in, and the bait's in here, and they go in, and they can't negotiate a way out. And this truly was the downfall of the alligator snapping turtle in the south because you could go into a stretch of river or bio with 30, 40, 50, 60 of these traps and they could just wipe out an adult population. You would get at least four out of five. I am quite sure that it's, it's stimulus response. Put the fish in the water in the trap, they're going to find a way to get in that trap. And it's just sad, but it gets them all. And uh, thankfully, there's no states left in the United States where the alligator snapping turtle can be commercially harvested. It took a long time coming, but um, 20 years makes a difference. And now the animal is so much more coveted and respected. I mean, it was really just kind of considered junk in Arkansas and Louisiana in the in the 80s and the 90s. There was no uh, worth given to that the that the Southerners just not all of them, but by and large, it it was so much part of the culture that it was taken for granted that. You know, we couldn't possibly endanger these things. They're, they're everywhere. And truth is, they, through the commercial harvest, they, they really knocked a big hole in them. These little box eggs. And this is just, this is how we ship them, uh, the little box with the little turtle thing on them, and we FedEx them. And, you know, my clients are cheaply hobbyists, just like I was when I was eight years old and got my first alligator snapping turtle for five dollars. There wasn't even UPS back then. It was came some special express mail. Um, but 
uh, you know, this has always been my my goal was to be able to supply legal licensed animals to people that were interested in them because I, I just knew that I was not the only one that was fascinated with these species. When I started, we didn't, there wasn't the internet. Us freaks couldn't get together that, you know, it, it, was, <laughs> it was paper print ads and stuff like that. Um, but now, you know, it's the internet has really set things up. Um, I was going to open up for short question session. If anybody had any uh, questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. So I heard that um, they still have how long to last in a good environment that alligators back in the can basically live. I can tell you that this is a very adaptive species, much more than I, much more than I thought when I first started. But, you know, they're very riverine in the southeast, so they can stand higher pHs than than I originally thought. They adapt to different diets, being opportunistic feeders, giving what nature offers them, whether it's persimmons falling off the trees in the south, or or mollusks or crayfish much more adaptive than, and you know, case in point, bringing these animals from the I-10 corridor, southern Louisiana, and bringing them uh, nearly 500 miles north of the I-44 corridor, and you don't lose any because of a harsher winter, a much harsher winter. So the, the, you have to give this species credit for being uh, ad adaptive. Yes, ma'am. Do you do anything to monitor or supplement the health of the declines? Um, Oxygenation, pipes, No, um, not a thing. It's all in nature's hands, and it has guided it exactly where it needs to go. Uh, can't take credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> did, yes, sir. Did you, did they ever dig each other's nests up? Yes. That's how they, you, you, and you see it right away because you'll see a few shredded eggs. Because for the way these turtles lay, they, they want to, you could have 100 square acres and you're still going to have 10 turtles that all want to lay in a five foot diameter area. Uh, it happens a couple, several times a year. And they usually don't take out the whole nest, but they, you, you see some shredded eggs and that's what has happened. One has finished its nest, and it, you know, before the sun comes up, another one comes up afterwards, hits that same spot. I mean, it's just kind of one of those things there's not much you can do about. Why, why do you think they spook like that? You said that- I think it's just a very naturally secretive, reclusive species. People often tell me, oh my God, I wouldn't stick my foot in that water. Those animals are the biggest chickens in the world. They don't want anything to do with you. Nothing to do with you. They would shy up to them. Coffin snappers, whole different story. They start associating people with food and they get downright wound up. Uh, they'll come out of the water to your feet if, if you know if you if, if, if you feed them long long enough these guys wired completely different won't play that game they will those animals will always be wild in that pond and honestly that's the way I want it that's the way I want it. I don't want to mess with those animals um, you know, let them be in their in their natural state not stressed out and uh, you know and I think we've got every Every female has is, is, is got to be laying every year because of the numbers of nests. Now we're running into a situation where I had an 800 egg spike after being 55, 5,600 for 11 or 12 years. Now all of a sudden it's up to 6,300 in one year. Nests that we missed, 20 years goes by, these turtles have matured, boom, you got, you know, F1s going in the same with their parents and that's something that I never ever that thought didn't even occur to me that it would make an impact like that that I would have increasing increasing eggs instead of kind of a gradual ebbing and, and, and down uh, downward trajectory of, of egg total yes 
What kind of permits and stuff are required? Missouri requires the class one uh, freighter's permit, a $50 a year permit, uh, it, which allows you to buy uh, any indigenous reptile and amphibian for the state. Um, it's, it, it, it's the same permit I have to have for the, the commercial end, and it's the same permit that somebody buys one alligator snapping turtle one time, it's the same permit, it's $50 a year. And it's nice that we have the, there's states that just ban them. You know, states like Florida, you can't have them anymore. Uh, there's no permit required or no, allowed. You can have a king cobra, but you can't have a captive bred alligator snapping turtle. So there's no balance to the laws. But just, you know, I'm thankful that Missouri has a program that where we can do this. Yes. Do you know about Illinois or? Yes, Illinois has a $50 a year permit. Um, goes through the DNR in Springfield. Uh, Scott Ballard is the point man, um, and he's uh, easy to work with. It's a straightforward program, and it's a, a, a good way of, of tracking uh, indigenous species that are species uh, that are either endangered or threatened or in, in need of conservation. Is there an education requirement or husbandry requirement for what he's asking for? No. So it's just a, a stamp? Okay. Yes. Yes. I, I can't, you know, Peter Pritchard, it was so instrumental to, to, and I don't think the man really had any idea of, of the effect he would have when he did his work, that there would be people that would take what he put out there and try to fill in the blanks and and, and, and carry it on and try to make a difference. And, you know, I didn't choose an academic route. I chose a more rogue route that, you know, is a little stained with commercialism. And I know that raises eyebrows a lot. But honestly, I wouldn't change a thing of what I did because I was presented with situations and you could have the argument, I shouldn't have done what I did. But I feel fortunate and you know, my heart is with this species. I happen to have made some money at it along the way, and I'm very grateful, and I would like to give back. I've offered Missouri free, captive-born, gender-determined babies, several hundred a year for a long, they're not interested. They're used to doing their own program. Illinois, I've made them the same offer. They're not interested. They're doing their own program. Um, I just say, I could make a big difference pretty fast, but you know, when the time comes, the time comes, and I'll be ready. Thank you all very much. Thank you.